you've got small everyday projects like you know, Victorian terrace houses or whatever, you're converting it, the first thing to do is check out the energy source. You know, it might be a high carbon oil or gas uh, boiler that you've got. So if you change that and do what we did here at the Waste House, which yeah, the Waste House is only, uh, it's only energy sources, the uh, uh, solar PV panels on the roof creating electricity. If you do that, you, you're in the world of uh, really decarbonizing the site, which is a, the first great big deal that you can do. Then after that, here, for example, we've got treble glazed windows at the Waste House. If you can look at the windows and change them, they're often with Victorian buildings, they're single glazed. You can get them to double or even treble glazing, that's great. So those first two moves are, are what you need to do really when you've got a historic building like a Victorian terrace. When you're talking about converting uh, older properties like Victorian terrace houses, for example, one of the first things to look at is the idea of adding insulation in the loft and if you've got a bit more money in the walls. Uh, those buildings were built without any insulation, so all the energy that you're paying for that goes into the building to warm it, it goes almost straight out again. So you're continually pumping energy in and that's why our bill, one of the reasons our bills are high. If you get a fleece like this, you can put it in the loft and put it on the walls and it will keep you warmer and keep the energy inside longer and therefore you'll pay less bills. This fleece is actually made out of uh, recycled duvets and it, it was inspired by a project we did here at the Waste House where we collected duvets and put them in the wall of the Waste House and they perform so well as insulation. Now there's a company that recycles them into this product and uh, you can buy it. Adaptive retrofit isn't just for wealthy people. It's going to have most impact on our poorer uh, parts of society. So I'm really interested in uh, retrofit for on a community scale. And we've now got, the good news is we've now got organisations such as the National Retrofit Hub who are liaising with communities and getting them talking to each other and delivering on retrofit schemes for large housing schemes. We've also got organisations such as Civic Square in Birmingham who are doing just the same with not only people's homes but where they work, their workplaces as well. Um, encouraging them to retrofit, to find money, to find grants to do this so that you know, um, fuel bills are reduced. Here in the Waste House, we've done our own uh, retrofit project. So this was the office space in the Waste House, but it's now been transformed into an, an affordable studio flat with built-in kitchen, dining table, bed, etc. made from locally sourced materials such as sweet chestnut from woodlands within 10 miles away. And it's great because our design students have learned, for example, how to make this furniture, including this lovely Sussex chair, which was a design by William Morris from the 19th century, so sort of relearning traditional trades. But crucially, these locally sourced materials are affordable and beautiful. Using waste materials is, is challenging, um, uh, you know, because normally you go, they flow straight to incineration or landfill sites. So if you've got waste materials on site, like here, this, this is a wall made out of waste chalk. We're here in Brighton, the ground below us is chalk. So this stuff normally gets put into lorries and then sent to landfill sites. However, we captured this stuff, it stayed on site, and uh, with a bit of work with some temporary shuttering and handheld compaction uh, tamping tools, we turned that chalk into a load-bearing wall. Now this is cheap material because it's everywhere, uh, but also the sort of manufacturing process, as it were, on site um, is not expensive either. And we've got a load-bearing wall that was made in one and a half days. I'm a big fan of minimalism and you know a lot of our industry and architecture and design has been for the last hundred, hundred years but sometimes if you're trying to achieve that just with white paint it's a bit flat and it's a bit disappointing but here for example with the waste house we've got these tiles which are in effect white but you can see they're all sorts of different colours and the reason they are is because they're slightly different mixes of material so this is just 100% oyster shells. So we've made these concrete tiles just out of oyster shells, some we've fired to create quick lime and then we've for the aggregates, so this stuff sticks together, we've crush, crushed up the other oyster shells. And you get this lovely sort of texture and sort of depth to the material. Here we've added some bricks so they get a bit pinky. 
So you've got this sort of, in effect, white tiles, but they're far more than white, and you get this sort of three-dimensional quality in depth, which you get with sort of uh, modernist paintings, paintings as well. And here, it's a bit flatter, but it's uh, still not flat. And these are the carpet tiles that we clad the waste house with originally. And from a distance, they look like a flat, normal slate. But when you get up close to them, they're not, obviously, there's something quite different. And I think that's the potential we've got. If we, we are including waste materials in our sort of palette and repertoire of design, then we're gonna have a sort of broader uh, opportunity for lots more creative responses to this idea of a sort of minimal modernist aesthetic. The reason we did this project initially was to raise people's awareness of where materials come from, the consequence of selecting materials and where they end up. And at the time when we constructed this building, for every five houses built, one house worth of waste went to landfill or incineration. So it's a huge, hugely wasteful industry, the construction sector is. And we wanted to prove that that stuff being burnt or sent to landfill was actually useful. And here what I'm standing in front of are a series of ongoing student experiments with waste materials and a lot of them are sort of plastics and and stuff and this one for example um, is also raising awareness of the consequences of suddenly changing the specification of wine corks from cork to plastic so this material here is actually made of plastic wine corks and the unexpected consequence of changing from cork to plastic was that the cork forests that were hundreds of years old in portugal and spain suddenly got grubbed up and destroyed and the biodiversity that they supported vanished. And there was a huge outcry about that. And now that stopped to a certain extent. Most wine has cork corks again. But what we did here is made it into a material that we could then design things out of and say, yeah, that's a lovely looking thing, but the material made out of it has got bad consequences. And here up here with the light fittings at the waste house, they're amazing. They're 85 years old. They're from a South Korean container ship. And why are they here? It's because they're second hand. They've got brand new light fittings in them, so they're low energy. So this is tick, tick. This is what the waste house is all about. But there's a story behind them. They're from a container ship that's been broken on a beach in Bangladesh. And the environmental and social consequences from that are huge and negative. If you, in, in Bangladesh, it's their second biggest industry. And what happens is that ships just get pulled up onto the beach and then broken up by the community that live near the beach. And then there's no protective clothing, no health and safety at all. And the you know, oil and other stuff just goes into the beach, into the water. And these boats, they take five or 10 years to break up because they're just done by really young people like children. So my question is, should those lights be here? And it gets people thinking about where stuff comes from. And so don't design things that involve people hurting, as it were, slaves or child labor. Design that out. And actually, if you're reusing the stuff that's around you, you're probably decoupling from that scenario. In addition to that, we've got all these other experiments in the waste house, material experiments that have informed projects such as our, such as our Street Hill farmhouse that's featured in the article in the modern house. And here we've got a lovely example of a, um, a material which is the, the finished material that we had inside on the walls and the ceilings in Street Hill House, and it's just our plaster. We've got a rough version of it going to a smooth version, but this plaster is made from material found on site, the chalk and clay on site, mixed together to make the plaster. Here we've got a waste brick, it even says waste brick on it. And this is made out of waste materials from site and just compacted into a brick. And now 100,000 of these bricks are being made at the moment in Belgium to create the new design museum in Delft. Now, actually, all we're doing here is remembering how bricks used to be made, because bricks were historically always made out of waste material. It was only when our country got really wealthy in the 19th century that we could make bricks out of new material. So they've always used to be made out of waste. Here we've got a gumdrop bin uh, made by one of our students, Anna Bullis, who did one, of the, did one of these experiments, but with chewing gum. And she realized that chewing gum was plastic. And now she's got a business that makes chewing gum bins out of chewing gum. So when this gets filled up with chewing gum, it stops the chewing gum going down onto pavements, which costs local authorities millions of pounds every year to clean pavements. The bin, the, the chewing gum goes into the bin, and when it's full up, it goes to Anna's factory to be melted down into more chewing gum bins, as well as Stan Smith 
training shoes, etc. So there are all these products now you can get that's made out of the nastiest waste product possible, or one of them, which is chewing gum. And here we've got an experiment that we did here where we collected duvets and we put them in the wall of the waste house and these duvets are used as insulation. Uh, but here we're, what we're doing, we've got a duvet that's filled with feathers and we then use the feathers to reinforce clay to make a box that the duvet could be in. So you've got these insulation boxes that would arrive on site and be a new construction system made one out of 100% waste material. And it's these sorts of things that we do at the waste house with our students that inform our practice, our real projects, and in our real projects, supply materials quite often for students' work. So there's a nice sort of synergy there. And uh, that's what's really exciting about this waste house, which is a sort of ongoing research project. So it's all very well doing this one-off demonstration project with the waste house, which is 55 tons of material other people threw away. Great, but how can I apply or how can you apply it to your projects in the everyday? Well, the good news is that our government is about to introduce legislation that's gonna actively encourage reuse. At the end of this year, there's gonna be something called the Circular Economy Roadmap for England, which will do just that. The other good news is I've written a book called the Reuse Atlas, which has got 40 case studies of construction projects across the UK, but also across Europe, where they've had more advanced uh, legislation around designing out waste for about the last 10 years. So these case studies are uh, architectural projects at the scale of an extension to a house or a one-off house, or a whole district of like 400 houses, where people have built new buildings using materials from old buildings and made money out of it, saved money by doing this, and crucially saved the need for consuming so many new raw materials where the mining and harvesting of these materials are one of the main contributors to the mass extinction of species and the climate emergency that we've got now. So it's becoming more and more affordable, but if you want to know more, just check out the Reuse Atlas. I think more people aren't aware of the potentials of reuse because we are really encouraged to buy new all the time. You know, at the moment, the way we think about our economy and, and how we create wealth is by growing the economy, by making more stuff, buying more stuff. Where historically, before, say before the Second World War, we were used to adapting stuff for, for you know, make do amend, uh, adapting buildings uh, all the time. Buildings were designed to be adapted rather than importing new stuff in, in all the time. So I think we've deliberately been steered away from it. That's unfortunate because if you reuse things, you save money and you create new jobs in the world of adaptive reuse. Uh, and there are other industries, so it's an alternative. And at the moment, it's under considered, but the information is out there actually.